I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about the industrial archaeology of the Neolithic. So I'm changing your perceptions of what industrial archaeology is. And it's a, it's a big call. I'm going to make some big, po big posters and statements. Changing the idea. Do I need to talk this? I can, I can enunciate all day if you want. In essence, I'm talking to you about Street House, a spectac spectacular site on the Yorkshire coast. That's just to give you an idea of context. I write notes, never look at them. Uh, it's a, we talked about the evaporation of, so of salt 6,000 years ago. So this is before Stonehenge, be before Scarabray. Think of those sites as Scarabray is the street house of the north. Stonehenge is the street house of the south. There's only one street, there's only one street house. This is occurring 6,000 years ago. They are manufacturing salt by evaporating water from the sea. I know there'll be questions. The fans got a problem already. Um, so it's a spectacular site. There's a fantastic focus of Neolithic sites at, at this location. So we've got evidence for industry, industrial archaeology, as I'm saying, burial, burial sites, settlements, ceremonial. Have I missed anything? We'll, we'll see. But, but in, in essence, there's a focus of activity here. And it's Industrial activity, industrial archaeology, as I'm call, call, calling it in, in essence. And we'll have a look at some, our next slide. What's a door? Okay, okay, yes. The manufacturing salt by evaporating seawater, and it's occurring in here two and a half thousand years earlier than any other site known in, in the UK. Previous evidence for salt manufacture was in the Bronze Age at Bring Down about 1400 BC. We're here 3800, possibly 3900 BC, where this is occurring. We can argue about the dates later, but I've got 10 radiocarbon dates, and four and a half thousand early Neolithic finds, nothing, nothing later. This is all occurring in an area the size of this window and up to us, it seems where, where Helen's sitting in, in the front row. So it's eight metres by five, concentration of spectacular archaeology where we've got all of the elements for manufacturing salt all together in one place. There's an Eric Markham parallel there somewhere, but I'll let you work that one out. So in effect, we've got bricketage vessels, the manufacture of these vessels in a kiln-type furnace. We've got the kiln and furnace structures and, and flow. We've got the kiln properties. We've got the, the, sci the scientific evidence. All of these elements together occurring this early, whereas in elsewhere in Western Europe at this time, you may be finding some bits of bricketage or one kiln or one kiln support. And there's evidence for one slightly later furnace like we, like we have here. But we've got all of the elements occurring in one location at this one site, but it's not happening once. It's not a one-hit wonder. They're not making a bit of salt to put on the chips and palm oil. There's a joke in that as well somewhere for you. They're making it on an industrial scale. So we've got all the industrial archaeology processes that we never thought about in the early Neolithic. So you might be thinking the early Neolithic, because we've got some Metalithic stuff occurring as well, since the darn early Neolithic, as a period when people stop all that hunter-gathering nonsense and start to set, settle down and grow crops, rear, rear a few animals, and perhaps you will know, make a ceremonial mon monument. That's the, that's the pattern, farming and big monuments. Here we're talking about industrial archaeology, industrial processes. And there will be problems. Why are they doing it there? Why aren't they doing it down, down on the beach? Well, there it's a rocky cliff, the highest cliffs in Yorkshire. This is about 117, 180 metres above, above sea sea level. It's presently uh, 500 metres from the site to, to the cliff edge. Before that, it's another, add another 300 metres. And then they'd have to lower a darn long rope to get to the bottom of the cliff. No, they've got to travel. So they've got to travel at least a kilometre from the site to the nearest bit of potential foreshore down here. Bearing in mind, we've got coastal erosion. I'm not making this up. Durham University have done surveys. You're losing 75 metres of cliff per 1,000 years. The maths on that says 450 metres further, further that way to get to, the, to get to the beach. But the tide's coming into the bottom of the cliff. So you can't manufacture your salt at the bottom of the cliff. They're collecting the brine at the bottom, bringing it, bringing it up and transporting it back to Street House. So they'll not be safe till Steve Sherlock finds it 6,000 years later. 
And the alternative to that is to go to Skinny Grove, two kilometres, or over the hill, go even higher, to get down to the other side to get to Staves. That's no good, let's just go to the trunk. So to show you what the challenge would be, I'll put it on camera now. Uh, the site is, is up here, which is a slope leading down past the near down to here. And this is about the syncline is going down there. This is about 30 to 50 meters off the beach. But if you imagine you're losing three to four hundred meters that way, I envisage there is a small small cove down there where there could be people collecting brine, uh, uh, evaporating it and transporting the products back for full evaporation on site. I'm not, hit, I'm not hitting it hard enough. Um, so I've got a chain of, op of operation for this and you can, I won't read it out to you, you can re read it yourself. But if we think about this, it's not as I say, it's not a one-hit wonder. It's a very task-orientated process of going onto the beach, collecting the, the dri collecting driftwood. It's going to be wet down there, so you've got to think about how they're doing that. A level of evaporation, pre preliminary evaporation, because you're only getting a three percent return on on your brine to get it back to salt. So it makes more sense to do an early evaporation on the beach, then bring a more concentrated brine up up to the site. So you've got that. You've got a transport. How do you carry your buckets of water? kilometer back up, up to the site. You've got storage on, on site in clear pits so that the liquor doesn't evaporate in the meanwhile before you, before by natural processes before you put it in, in the fire. You've got people manufacturing pots on site, that can be proven as well, firing the pots in a type of pottery that is unique to this country at that time. Everyone knows early Neolithic carinated bowls, it's got a saggy bottom. But the street house vessels are, f are flat, shallow for evaporation. You're not wanting the bit at the bottom to evaporate the next salt. You want flat based vessels so you've got an even surface of heat ganning all, all the way across. We've also got the scientific evidence for, for the evaporation, the salt crystals in the bottom of the pot. So we've got all of, all of the elements in the right place. I'm, gonna, I'm running through this. I trust you, you can read. I've put all the tasks down there. And so, give you an idea. Let's have a look at what you could have won. So this is a plan of, of the site with a series of activities. You've got a furnace here, which is the source, which is the source of heat. A flue, well, didn't have, the next one of those is, a, is a, looking, looking south, but it's bronzy. With a heat that's drawn, drawn through here. Beneath a series of open halves, which have intact vessels on them, where, where the evaporation process is occurring. Uh, it's open at this point in the, in the structure so that you can put more liquor on as you're going, going along. You've got these three settling tanks where, where you labour, your, 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 uh, let's call them mules because there's a parallel for that later on. Your mules have brought the liquor to its the tanks. You can't see on the, you can't see on the beach, sorry. The store here, then somebody stands there, decants the liquor in, into these pans and it crystallises and evaporates. And on the image on, on the right is, this is a deep structure. I haven't said that. It's nearly three metres deep. So we, we've taken a while to get down to it. And at that level, in 2019, we find the top of the furnace where the dome had collapsed in. So you've got a burnt structure. It's not open. It's been closed as a dome at this point. But in terms of what it... You've got better than this than me. Um, effectively, you've got your furnace here, flue... Blue coming down that, that stone to this channel here to a fire there, it's drawing the heat, drawing heat through, uh, and then a chimney at, at that end. So this is the working area, to get an idea of the scale. Standing room in the middle only, and a series of pit, pits on, on that side. So as I say, we've got four and a half thousand early Neolithic finds at that location. 3,300 flint, flint tools, some cores, some blades, some of them 
Mesolithic in form. Mm -hmm. Let's think about what's going on there. And 1,200 plus sheds of pottery. We've also got some hazel that still give us a bit of radiocarbon days. And some worked stones because they're, they're making and shaping stones as props within within the furnace, within the, within the structure. So the vessels can sit on the on this whole piece. So there's an awful lot going on there. And being conscious of time, I'm running. Effectively, why has this survived? Because there's terra firma, that's about 600, then it steps down. And at this point where the furnace, this wall you can see there, has survived, that's two metres below ground, and another half a metre through for the flue, half a metre deeper for the flue going through. So somebody's gone to a darn sight lot of trouble to make this. It's not a one-hit wonder. They didn't sort of have a mouldy old door or some one one thing that worked once they've repeated this time and time again emphasizing that it's in, industrial in scale which we don't usually see in the in the neo, neolithic so this taking the process a bit further i've taken the furnace out earlier this summer there's a piece of the flue there through which the hot air is sucked <coughs> down uh, through by those stones so this deeper channel uh, and we've had a vessel in situ here. This is a, this is a replica. Here's one some of you may have seen earlier. You're noted. Uh, but we did find a vessel there and the props that the, that the hot air goes underneath. The, we did have ceramic vessels about 600 millimetres long in this trough-like snout, sh snout shape and salt crystals up to 450 parts per million on the, on the upper surface, which has been burnished. On the lower surface, it's smooth. There's just got lots of charcoal flowing un un underneath it. And these were done as part of a reconstruction that was done by Sheffield University. Big shout out there. Uh, Yvette and Nick. <coughs> yeah. Uh, where they reconstructed the shape of the piece and, and, and a flow and put some reticular pots in, in place. This is from, done for a TV programme, so they helped. They brought along some bottles bottles of water, pure water from, from the sea, poured, poured it in. And I've got it on film, but we don't have time. Uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. It evaporated within a minute. So we had crystallisation, with pr proof of concept, if, if, you, if you like, of this occurring in the form of all the elements that I've found at this location in, in this site here. That we found initially found by geophysics, and I was told, "Oh, it might be a pottery kiln seed." And six years later, we get to the, the note of, of the point. But the geophysics didn't just show me this one site. It's there's more than one thing happening. There's another one just just to the another site like it, just to the north, which I opened this year just to have a sneaky peek. And as you can see, it stands out like a dog's what it's in that there's a, a white. Stain, staining there, standing out against the rest of the orange clay. And that's a calcium carbonate product that, that again had a high proportion of, we did some PXRF on it, had a high indicator of, of salt, salt crystals in, in it. So, but it's sitting at, at a depth, at a height of 30 centimetres, so it's present at that level. So they've dug that deep hole from from this 30 centimetre height. So they've gone to, you know, they've shifted, let's say, 20 tonnes of muck to, to create all of, the, all of the structures on that other piece. Then part of the, the industrial waste, if you like, we're not getting any slag debris, but we're getting this white, this white calcium carbonate forming. And we found this also in, this, in the 2016 site, the one I've been showing you earlier. And it's 30 centimetres thick, rock, rock hard solid, it's not unique because they've also found it on a later Neolithic site in, in northwest Spain, uh, uh, near, near Zamora, Sancho Molino too. They recorded having this white clay compacted deposit over, the, over the, their later Neolithic product. So that's a byproduct. We can, once we recognise it, we can find it. It's, Again, being a nosy devil and have the time, we, we took a bit of that off. We found a stone, stone surface underneath, and the only finds we've got from it is about 70, uh, 70 Neolithic flints and flakes. I'm, I'm bringing it up time, I know, I'll be brief. Uh, we just got, took it to the level where we, where we planned the stones, 
there is a pit, uh, there are a series of, I can see them, this is the ice, but there's these stone forms to it running, running through. And how I, how I see this working, uh, it's all part and parcel of the process. They're getting the evaporation and the salt crystals on the pans, as, as per the halves you've seen earlier. Then they have to form, form it, get it to dry. They're bringing it up, putting it in smaller vessels, and potentially storing it in here, almost like a threshing floor, where there's a through flow of hot, of air that's coming from that side, flowing through there, and going out the other. I hope with the eye of faith, you can see there are these linear arrangements r running through it. Nobody's got anything like this. You might think this is big BS, but I'm, I'm giving you, trying to give you a functional view of how, of how it would work. Back to the furnace originally. I had alluded to the fact that we were making, we were making pottery on, on site. You see there's two thin sections there. One, one of them is the, we, we had puddled clay from part of, part of the site, which is, and so I made, made some pots with that, Bricketor style, and bri briquettes, had them thin sectioned. Had a section, had a sample made of, of one of the pieces of bricketage, but we're putting one against, against the other. And that's the Neolithic, and that's the, or is it the other way around? I do know. Trust me, I've said that one. Uh, at the bottom of the furnace, they're making pots in the furnace uh, as well, because they're making pots on site. They've got to find them somewhere. I could be fanciful and think, oh, well, in, in the Neolithic, we always had a bonfire 50 metres away and find it over there. They've got a bloody great furnace. They're firing pots inside it. And we've got the, we've got fragments of cores and waste of the vessels, as you can see, in the, in the bottom from the sample that we, that we lifted uh, as a block. Um, to summarize then, as if I could, uh, we've got a process, and you can see it in, in plan here, going from the furnace, the, the flue, the open, open vessel there, there's one there, there's another half here. And this part of the flue, I think it is sealed uh, with, with possibly wicker or something like that. There's certainly nothing structural to support it, but that's to get in there. They are air to draw through, because another fire, fire here, and then there's a chimney. So you've got, you've got like a kiln or a roast type of structure. Again, unparalleled, but it just, it doesn't mean it wasn't there. It, it's, that's how I'm seeing it, it would have, would have worked. These are the, this is the reconstruction on, on, on this side, and I'm seeing that this has been boarded over because we've got this sequence of post holes in the side of this. I'm thinking it's making some sort of platform that can walk over to this. Because again, that's going up, that's holding at least a, a meter depth of brine that's been brought up in possibly settling in, in different zones of, of the of the tank. Trust me, this is this is the last side, it's like you will get some lunch. Um, so to see it as a, as a near, Neolithic landscape, you've got a contour survey of a, there's a Neolithic house here that was above the Sultan. Then there's the Sultan. Then there's the other one that we've seen. Then there's another Neolithic house that you've got got round got round here. And the Neolithic long cave at the top there that Blaze excavated, Blaze excavated in um, 1979, 1980. Trust me, I was there. I am old enough. So you've got a tremendous concentration of Neolithic activity going on here. Why? Well, A, think, think of it as you've got a very, very valuable pro product. Are you going to leave it on the beach in the forty or at Skinny Grove and hope nobody comes along and nicks it? No, you're not. You're going to keep it close to, your con to where, where your settlement is, where you can control the finished product and access to the, the, the mechanic mechanics of it. That's all the other models for salt working later suggest that, including some LVK sites. So that's what I suggest they're doing here. So if we accept for a moment that I'm right in that they're making it here, there's lots of technological questions. There's ideas and ramifications on how we think about the Neolithic if it's an industrial society, the trading this, who they're selling it to, what, what they're getting what they're getting back in, in, in return. And more fundamentally, we're talking about lots of sea changes in terms of the technology. What on earth were they smoking when they thought of building all, all this here? Or did they import, did they import the, the technology? Which I don't really believe they do. But who did it? So there's two possible models you could look at for how this works. I've suggested there's a chain of operation where you've got a task-orientated society. Some people looking after livestock that are going to bring, that are going to bring, bring the 
the brine up up to the site, possibly using the, the bullocks gra grazing along the route because you've got a dairy herd here because we've got lipids on the pots as well that says the pro the processing milk products with the salt making cheese of course. So uh, that's another that's another side invention. They're making pots here as well. There's an awful lot going on. Do you have almost two revolu two revolutions? going on because that's the theme of the day is it a marxist revolution where we've got workers taking different zones of activity and working working together to produce to produce a product or do you have uh, is it sort of a capitalist economy where you have some uh, some let's call him some bat baron run, running a, a cartel manufacturing a, a white product that's highly highly prized he's got loads of People who are working as uh, minions, if you like, and doing all of this man manual work, and, and then as mules transporting it around. So, if I was looking at this as a model to see how it would work, can we think of anywhere in Afghanistan or Bolivia I could see if there's a business model that applied to? I nearly said the third world. It would have been. I would have got my legs slapped for that. Applied to that <laughs> level of society that we could say that could be how they were doing this. 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 Initi this initiative at, at Street House, drug capital of the North, if, if, if you like. So there's two models I've got to investigate. I've just done the archaeology and give you a lot of inf information. And if I've got any questions, I'll either be dead disappointed or think you're dead hungry and you want to dip off to lunch. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>